Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, this is Charlie Rewa with NRCS. I'm the um, com uh, wildlife component leader for the Conservation Effects Assessment Project. And I want to welcome everybody this morning to this uh, little briefing we put together on work we've been doing with the Golden Wing Warbler. Um, and um, thanks for joining us, everybody. Uh, please keep your microphones on mute. Uh, for uh, the duration of the the, 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 um, the briefing this morning, and at the end we'll have hopefully we'll have some time for questions, and you can un unmute your mic then, or go ahead and just uh, put questions in the chat as we go along here. Um, well, to get things started, um, over the last ten years or so, uh, NRCS has been working uh, with our partners to to develop young forest habitats, um, primarily for the golowing warbler. Um, and um, the work has been primarily done through the Working Lands for Wildlife Partnership uh, in Appalachia, and there's an uh, RCPP project in the Great Lakes also focused on golden wing warblers. And through the years, um, I guess beginning in about 2012, um, uh, SEEP Wildlife uh, has developed a partnership with the Indiana University of Pennsylvania and other universities to help document outcomes and support and to support the science for a better program delivery for golden wing warblers. And through the years, we've generated a lot of outcomes. Um, and there's a lot of peer reviewed uh, published papers in the literature and lots of different reports. Um, but with NRCS's recent focus on highlighting outcomes more, uh, both, both internally and externally, um, we have uh, you know, in the spirit of sharing those outcomes, we've set up this uh, briefing for primarily for NRCS field folks involved with golden wing warbler work to give everybody an opportunity to see, you know, kind of what we've learned um, and sort of where we're going with this effort. And so um, Dr. Jeff Larkin with the Indiana University of Pennsylvania uh, Research Institute and uh, the American Bird Conservancy um, has been leading this effort uh, in to help support the science behind uh, working lands for wildlife for golden wing warblers. Um, and he's agreed to, to share with us some of the findings that, uh, that we've been learning um, today. Um, we are recording this briefing so that folks who aren't able to attend will be able to uh, pick it up later. Um, if you have questions as we go along, go ahead and put those in the chat box. And like I said, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to address some of those questions uh, and have a little discussion. Um, but before we turn it over to Jeff, I wanted to uh, turn it over to Denise Coleman, our state con there in Pennsylvania, uh, to give a little uh, update from the state perspective there. So Denise, I'll turn it over to you and then we can uh, uh, get it over to Jeff eventually here. So go ahead. Thank you. Thanks, Charlie. I just want to thank you both, uh, Charlie and Dr. Rio. Dr. Larkin, um, we originally had this idea of bringing this forward to some of our state implementers, um, our field people, and Charlie was uh, very happy to do so. And I wanted to um, extend a thank you to both he and Dr. Larkin for agreeing to provide this um, overview to the people who, who've done a lot of work to make this initiative happen. I think when Jeff and I started on this, we originally thought it would be in an initiative, but it has turned out to be a marathon. Um, we've been working on this now for three farm bills. We're really excited with the progress that, at least for, I can speak for Pennsylvania, that we've made. And as a result, we've hired uh, or entered into partnerships for uh, two NRCS foresters, um, as well as a state forester, and as, and um, a partnership with Pennsylvania Game Commission for a third forester. So altogether, we've added additional four foresters um, after we saw the demand and interest in this, this initiative, which has turned into kind of a long-term commitment about sustainable forestry and early successional forests in Pennsylvania. Um, I didn't want to speak for everybody in the region, but I thought since a lot of, we had, really publicized it here in Pennsylvania. I did want to give our field folks, Charlie, just a little bit of an overview um, on the program side of how many contracts that was and what that 
what all that turned into and how much money. So with that said, I'll turn it over to Barry France, our assistant for programs. Okay, thanks, Denise. And so I, I did some quick number running this morning. Uh, this is, these numbers will be, Denise said through three, three farm bills. We started with WIP in the 2008 farm bill and through EQIP in the 2014 and continuing now in the 2018 farm bill. But, you know, that's eight years worth. We're, we're looking good for two, uh, 2020 that uh, a ninth year farm bill support. So almost 260 contracts up through the end of 2019, over $7 million in those contracts. And that does not include contracts that the landowner had to back out for whatever reason. Uh, $5.4 million obligated and uh, paid out in practices. Um, 11,500 contract acres, uh, 730 practices implemented and about another 250 on the books to be implemented. So that's, that's a huge workload. Um, and I'll say when I think back um, some of the early discussions for those in the field, uh, you know, it's there's a lot of fun stuff walking through the woods with the landowners and partners, but there's a lot of just grunt work to get these contracts in the books and implement it and talk with the landowners and work with them on their needs and their personal situations to keep these contracts going. It just doesn't happen because people like to see good things happening in the woods. There's a lot of good background work and um, I'll say I think back to a lot of the district conservationists and partners and field people that worked on this in 2012. And some of those folks are retired for you know four, five, six years now. But you know, I think we're starting to see the the legacy of the work they did back in 2012 and 13 when we started on all this. So hopefully um, you know, they're aware of this and give um, a thanks not just to the folks working on it now, but those those people who started out with us and, you know, this is long-term habitat improvement. And we really literally almost have a generation of people who have been working on this, you know, to get the results that we're seeing now. So I'll stop there and turn it over to whoever's next. Well, I'll just uh, say thank you, Barry and Denise, for your efforts there and helping support this really heavy lifting that's been going on to deliver uh, these conservation benefits. So. Uh, now I think we get to sit back a little bit and uh, get some perspective on, on really what what the uh, natural resource outcomes have been from all that heavy work. So uh, with that, uh, unless Denise, you have anything else, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Dr. Jeff Larkin uh, to give us the, uh, the majority of the overview here. So sounds Jeff? great. Okay, thanks. It's all yours, Jeff. Good morning. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, I am. Um, I'm excited to to be here to share with some of uh, you know share some of our findings from uh, the monitoring efforts that um, have really focused on evaluating NRCS programs that are intended to help reverse the the decline of that critter you see on the screen, the golden wing warbler. And of course, in the process, and I think that um, both. Uh, Charlie and Denise hinted on this along the way, you know, really embodied the whole helping people help their lands and in this case, help their forests. And, and ultimately, um, and I'll share some of these associated species benefits today, you know, ultimately all of this wraps up into uh, improved forest health, as well as um, just uh, tangential outcomes, positive outcomes for forest biodiversity in general. Uh, so again, happy to be here to share this information with you this morning. I am the fortunate one that um, is is here presenting to you. Uh, I represent a large collective of individuals that have done an immense amount of work to uh, make all of this possible, and uh, and I give them much thanks uh, for for allowing me to be the one that um, sits and I guess in the spotlight for a little bit to share our findings. Charlie, my screen. Oh, there. Okay. Uh, sorry, there was a delay there in the in the slide transition. We see it. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, so here's the, I guess, the star of the show for the morning and and for uh, for the programs which we are uh, going to be talking about here, the golden wing warbler. 
little bit of background uh, on the species. You know, you, you, we, we touched on it there a moment ago. A lot of folks are uh, are in field offices and not in the forest, and um, you know, haven't probably seen a golden wing warbler, and uh, but but yet they have been so instrumental in uh, helping to do their part to reverse the decline of the species. So let's just kind of introduce ourselves to the to the golden wing warbler for a moment. It's a neotropical migratory songbird, so it winters, spends most of its time in Central and South America. When it joins us here on the North American continent, it spends time in early successional forests and shrublands, like what you see there on the right. Uh, the species has been declining uh, pretty precipitously since 1966, and, and in particular in the Appalachians population uh, has been declining quite severely. And it's currently being considered for listing under the Endangered Species Act. Uh, that map that you see there in all of the red, obviously that's not good. Uh, and you can see that there's plenty of uh, orange and red in the Great Lakes states as well, and that's breeding bird survey data. Um, again, uh, trying to take you just on a little bit of a, a virtual trip into golden wing warbler habitat. This is a female that just completed her trip back from someplace in Venezuela or Colombia. Um, flew across the Gulf of Mexico and then up, uh, up into our part of uh, Pennsylvania in this case. Uh, she's building her nest. This, this video gives you a little bit of an idea of the structure that uh, we're trying to achieve for the species. Uh, so you can see in, in, uh, in the background here, we've got a lot of woody stems uh, starting to regenerate in this stand. Those are going to be um, things like blackberry or brambles, call it what you will, rubus. We've got this kind of herbaceous component. As she's building her nest, she's coming down a, a blackberry uh, stem and then into this uh, clump of goldenrod. Got a little bit of fern coverage here. But what you would say, I guess, ultimately in this in this image is that it's quite a you know, quite a mosaic of different cover types. A big wad of leaves in her mouth. She's gonna go back down that stem. And she will, uh, so she's she's initiating the nest building right now with these big quartz materials. Um, so yeah, just uh, to give you an idea of, of, of the kinds of habitat that they're looking for when they're nesting. Jeff, could so I this, just stop you there and ask everybody to please mute your mic unless you're Jeff that's speaking, thank you. Uh, so, I mentioned that this species is, is a migratory songbird, uh, so we can think about it having many challenges throughout the full annual cycle. Um, overwintering habitat loss, challenges along the migration route. And today we're going to be focusing on this part of the circle, the breeding season part of the circle, and the species joins us here in North America. And um, a, a lot of the, the concern with the species or the, 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 the the reason for its decline has been changes in forest management practices as well as just changes in land use practices when we think about the abandonment of a lot of, a lot of agricultural lands and how those lands transition to closed canopy forest now. Uh, and then, of course, again, the changes in silvicultural practices that often do not result in young forest uh, patches like you would see here. So instead, we have a lot of forested landscapes that are of a single uh, older closed canopy age class. And of course, there are many species of early successional that depend at least for some portion of their life cycle on early successional forests and shrublands that uh, are, are suffering from a, a loss of availability, reduced availability of that habitat type. This is FIA data from Pennsylvania, just as an example. And we can see over time from the late 70s until recently, we have seen this uh, gradual and consistent decline of the amount of young forest in our landscapes. And we could show this graph or any number of eastern uh, states, and we would see a similar pattern. And the golden wing warbler breeding birds survey data over that time period, you know, brilliantly mirrors that decline of, of habitat. So um, it's, it's important that we have programs such as those um, being initiated by NRCS and other public agencies to increase the amount of young forest habitat across our landscapes. The Golden Wing Warbler uh, Working Group uh, conducted a series of uh, research efforts in the late 2000s uh, to create ultimately the Golden Wing Warbler Conservation Plan. And along with that conservation plan, they also synthesize their findings into management guidelines. And these guidelines are the, 
are the the um, products that we work very hard to get into the hands of practitioners so that they can go forth and uh, and create the much needed habitat that the species needs. And of course, private forests are critical uh, for golden wing warbler conservation. Um, you take a look at this map and it's pretty clear um, that private lands are going to be an important, must be uh, an important part of the answer for re reversing the decline of the species. Sure, public land uh, efforts are important as well. They provide us with larger uh, land holdings to do a series of, uh, of implementations over the long term, providing areas for core refugia for the species. But again, we will not succeed if we cannot succeed on private forest lands in, in the east for sure. And, and it's a wonderful relationship, this Golden Wing Warbler Conservation Initiative and NRCS, because uh, in keeping with Working Lands for Wildlife, you know, it, it is truly a win-win opportunity for wildlife and producers. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Yes, we implement uh, sustainable forest-based practices, and they create a habitat for a declining species. But this is a bigger forest health issue that we're able to uh, address at the same time. And by addressing those concerns, uh, we're improving uh, the future availability of wood fiber, quality recreational opportunities, whether you be a bird hunter or a bird watcher or something uh, other that takes advantage of having these increased amounts of, of this unique habitat type on our eastern landscape. And then, of course, you know, a very important part of all of this, which doesn't probably get talked enough about, is, of course, the economic opportunities uh, to private forest owners and the rural economies that can be uh, supported now and into the future. 2012 Golden Wing Warbler was selected as one of uh, the Working Lands for Wildlife Partnership's original focal species, and it was the Appalachians component. Uh, and as Barry and Denise uh, pointed to earlier, we went to work quite early on in that process, um, doing uh, the various things that needed to be done to, um, to, to, to take advantage of those resources that were available to us. Not long after that, our great partners in the Western Great Lakes states uh, joined the quote party, if you will, uh, in 2015 to 2020, the Regional Conservation Partnership uh, program in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan um, uh, started a, a, pro a project that was um, golden wing warbler centric. So we're we'll talking about uh, evaluating both of the Working Lands for Wildlife efforts as well as the Western Great Lakes uh, efforts. So welcome to our West, uh, our Western Great Lakes um, partners to the to the webinar as well. Glad glad to have you here. Um, I wanted to in, before we get to the results, you know. Uh, Barry and Denise pointed to this earlier, but I, I want to say that that this webinar is really a, a tribute to the folks that that allow us to have something to actually monitor, right? If it wasn't for partner foresters and planners and the many NRCS field office staff that go to work every day to do good things for the land and for the species, uh, we wouldn't really have anything to monitor now, would we? Uh, that that process is is complicated and, and it's not just in the forest. It's behind the scenes. It's paperwork and it's and it's those conversations with landowners and with partners to make all of this um, make all of this work and become habitat. Meeting you know, NRCS staff and partners meeting with landowners, uh, foresters, partner foresters going out and assessing uh, project sites, uh, helping landowners uh, with the implementation process making sure that they're there when for uh, when contractors enter a site so they can ensure early on that best management practices are being followed. Habitat being implemented, final projects, and then of course as it becomes um, golden wing habitat, but also, you know, just wonderfully structurally diverse regenerating forest and you can imagine what this forest looks like in a few years 15 years multi-layered canopy uh, incredibly healthy and maybe there's not a golden wing nesting in there but there's a wood thrush and a cerulean warbler and, and other species that are benefiting from this work 
Uh, here are some of the numbers I have for the Working Lands for Wildlife program across uh, the entirety of, of the Working Lands for Wildlife eligibility area, uh, not including the 2020. But 17,000 acres and over 350 landowners that have been served uh, through this program. And in the Great Lakes, again, um, less acreage because we started about five, uh, well, three or four years later um, through the RCPP, but 4,620 acres uh, to date uh, implemented in Minnesota and Wisconsin. And, and also uh, a, a big hats off to many of our public land partners. Uh, and I just provide an example at the bottom of the screen here, uh, 2013 to present, the ABC Minnesota Public Lands Program, um, primarily funded through the uh, Outdoor Heritage Program, has added additional acres, acreage on, commun uh, on, on county, uh, state, tribal, and, and federal agency lands. Uh, the synergy between the private lands and the public lands efforts across both the Appalachians and the Great Lakes is something that's uh, really um, nice to see. It's important to see, and, and, and I think uh, as being someone that's involved with both of those aspects, I, I get to see that, that that's continuing to grow uh, and, and, it's, and it's promising, I think, for the species moving into the, for, uh, into the future. So that's great. We're we're contracting a lot of money and we're um, putting a lot of uh, footprints on the landscape and we measure that through acres and dollars. Um, but as Charlie pointed out, you know, there's a, a, a greater need for outcome assessments and, and for outcome assessments to move beyond uh, acres implemented and to be thinking about how species uh, or, or ecosystems are responding. So what are those species or biological outcomes? to these kinds of programs. And it's important, A, because implementation funding is still limited, um, quite limited based on, you know, compared to the, the work that needs to be done. And of course, when we know more about how species are responding to initiatives that target their conservation, we have the science foundation to allow us to, to, to do what we call adaptive management. Learn from past implementation activities to inform future activities. And that's really what the Conservation Effects Assessment Project has allowed us to do here. One component of that very important project is the evaluation of uh, Working Lands for Wildlife and RCPP for Golden Wing Warbler. Real quickly on methodologies, each spring um, 2015, we initiated this, it, we, we send out a uh, an army of well-trained, qualified technicians uh, to traverse these thick forested uh, habitats and uh, find themselves to a random point and conduct bird surveys and vegetation surveys. Again, that started in 2015 with a primary question, what drives successful outcomes for habitat programs that target the golden wing warbler? What I'm going to share with you this morning is just the tip of the iceberg, um, and this is actually uh, the foundation of Dr. McNeil's PhD research. Uh, DJ finished uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, he couldn't be with us here today to, to share uh, in, in, in the webinar, but I wanted to give him credit for the, for the great work that he did at, as a PhD student at Cornell. This project surveyed 667 unique sites in the Great Lakes and the Appalachians conservation regions across those uh, primarily those three years. In the central Appalachians, 430 sites, uh, both a mix of public and private land points, dominated mostly by private land points. And uh, in the Western Great Lakes regions, I'm sorry, uh, those, were, uh, those were all uh, private land points and the result of forest management. There's a whole other analysis and paper that has to do with the, sh the shrubland, uh, aspen, and alder shearing in the Great Lakes that um, we'll hopefully come back and present on in the, in the future. Um, lots of stuff that we could uh, have future webinars on for sure. So uh, we would delineate a boundary around a treated area, uh, uh, also have a buffer, that thinner yellow line, to ensure that we were not sampling uh, on the edge and into the uh, unmanaged as much as possible. Uh, then we would have a random point placed within all of these treatment areas. That would be the place that we would actually conduct, conduct the point count. Point counts were 13 minutes in length, and they involved a playback of the Golden Wing Warbler song at the end. 
so that we could actually increase detection uh, of the species in case there was one there that was quiet. Um, it's just a, a methodology that we would use to, to do that. Actually didn't really help with detection much. We usually um, observe the bird um, if it was there without the playback, but nonetheless a, a good protocol to, um, to use. We visited each of these points twice per year, and then we also visited a third time to do a pretty intense uh, in, in-stand patch level vegetation assessment. The patch level assessment uh, would, uh, would have centered around, again, the point count location. Uh, and in this case, we would survey vegetation or, or quantify vegetation within that circle around that point within 100 meters. And at the landscape scale, a larger scale, a thousand uh, meters out or one kilometer circle, we would use uh, GIS and various land cover uh, data layers to assess uh, uh, golden wing warbler occupancy or abundance. So moving on to the results uh, in the Appalachians. Uh, one thing we can see here is that over that time, we saw a steady increase of, occup of occupancy. Um, so that would be uh, the, the probability of a site being occupied by at least one male golden wing warbler. And you can see in the public lands, a higher occupancy rate and pretty consistent across time, largely because those public lands may have been on the landscape for a year or two longer than the Working Lands for Wildlife uh, projects had been implemented. So a little bit more time for the vegetation to, um, to, to succeed into what golden wings uh, desire, and I'll show more on that in a moment. Another thing to um, point out is that the distribution of occupied points were quite patchily distributed. We see a lot of vacant sites and no golden wing warblers over this time period detected in western Maryland or northern New Jersey. More on that in a moment. Um, if we quickly move to the results of our analyses at the patch level. Remember I said we did all of these, you know, we quantified all these veg variables. Well, the, the only one that turned out to be important in our analysis was at the patch level was the number of growing seasons after treatment. So uh, you, you can recall what that bird was building its nests in and, and really early on after uh, implementation, the structure just isn't quite there yet. But of course, as time goes on, the structure gets there and the species um, responds accordingly. At the landscape level, it was the amount of deciduous forest in the landscape within that one kilometer being very important and not having much in the way of mixed forest cover in the landscape. So the, f the type of forest matters. We know that, it, you know, we knew all along that it wasn't um, coniferous forest, but really shedding light on the, the extent to which the species um, seems to avoid at a landscape scale, mixed forest cover is, is an important finding for sure. Another very important finding was that the distance to an existing golden wing warbler population was really important in the Appalachians. You saw those patchily distributed um, occupancy, uh, that occupancy map. When we combined our data with those from other sources like eBird, it, it revealed that all occupied sites were less than 20 miles from another occupied site and that 99% were within 8.5 miles of an occupied site. You can think about the importance, if you have a dollar to spend on golden wing conservation, how important it is going to be to make sure you're working in landscapes that have a source population and we can build out from those. Moving on to the Western Great Lakes, uh, a different story. You can see occupancy quite high there uh, relative to what we saw in the Appalachians. And these are the sites, by the way, in both these, uh, both the Appalachians graph and this graph. These are sites that we monitored all three or four years of the monitoring. Um, if we would continue to add new sites, then of course we would see lower occupancy uh, or about the same occupancy each year. So when you think about the sites that we monitored over the long term, um, these we see that occupancy was high to begin with, over 70 uh, percent occupancy, and, and certainly approached uh, close to 90 by year three of these sites. And we were able to uh, run the analyses not based on occupancy in the Great Lakes, but actually based on abundance. And you can see from this particular map that um, at many sites, of course, had at least one male, but there are many dark red in um, in really dark crimson colors here that show that there are multiple males 
on many of the sites uh, we occupied. Patch level and the Great Lakes, the most important was the number of growing seasons. Again, uh, makes sense and consistent with the Appalachians. And again, consistent with the Appalachians, the amount of mixed forest on the landscape was something that the species did not particularly key in on, uh, or we could say uh, avoided. So in summary of golden wing warbler specific results, you know, if we think about that fields of dream question, if you will, if we build the habitat, will the focal species come? Now the answer is in the Western Great Lakes, likely yes. Um, model occupancy by year three approached 90%. Abundance as uh, the sites aged uh, continued to grow uh, in number. In the central Appalachians, maybe. It's promising. It's certainly worthy of continuing the program, that's for sure. Um, but, you know, much less uh, occupancy. But we also know that we don't have a golden wing warbler hiding under every rock waiting for available habitat. The golden wing warbler population in the Appalachians is dismally low. Uh, it is what is driving uh, the reason that uh, folks would like to have that species considered for listing. But if we take into account the proximity of um, source populations, certainly that occupancy, uh, that percent of occupied sites would increase. Um, and, and that's an important point. The SEEP effort identified features that can help improve occupancy and abundance and manage forests in both regions. And what was um, really enlightening was the same features, both time since harvest or treatment and the amount of mixed forest on the landscape were consistent uh, important factors. And we can think about what uh, these sites look like early on and what they need to look like over time to be attractive to golden wings. So we have this animation here where after we might have some residual trees across the, the treated area, we get some herbaceous cover, goldenrods, uh, grasses, sedges, um, you name it. Over time, we get the shrub and sapling component, and that's when we start to have you know, all of the ingredients for the golden wing warbler nesting um, habitat. And, and this is just a schematic showing that you know, what we could expect for both occupancy in the Appalachians, and you can make a very similar graph for abundance in the Great Lakes states, whereby time after treatment, you see a growth and in, uh, increase in occupancy and an increase in abundance. Now, we should also point out that there's going to be a point, right? So all of our sites were relatively young, no matter what region. There's going to be a point where this closed canopy, this stem exclusion phase occurs. And of course, it's no longer nesting habitat for golden wings. But it should be pointed out that it is an extremely important post fledging habitat for golden wing warblers. This is the kind of stuff that they are going to bring their young into once they leave the nest that's out here. So be patient. Um, you know, our, our, our modeled occupancy in, uh, in the Appalachians show that you still only got about a 50% chance of occupancy at year six. It's probably a good year to be evaluating projects um, for occupancy. If you had to pick a year to determine whether a site was occupied, I think that year six mark would be good. Now, a little bit of a shout out to our friends in uh, New Jersey. Um, we mentioned earlier that they uh, had not, we had not detected a golden wing warbler on their sites. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to share with a, a, a newspaper article that uh, New, New Jersey Audubon and um, New Jersey uh, Game and Fish provided. And uh, it's uh, from earlier this year. It's, uh, you know, that first site, the site, uh, the picture on the left is from 2014. Um, the picture on the right is the same site, 2020, in which monitoring um, by our partners there in New Jersey found a golden wing warbler. Um, and isn't that interesting? Six years post, just as our, um, our other uh, modeling results indicated, uh, we see golden wing warblers colonizing the site. Um, the point here is keep, uh, keep working hard, create the habitat, and uh, exciting to say that we also have documented the species on sites in Maryland um, post uh, our monitoring efforts. So New Jersey, Maryland, um, hang in there. Um, I think we'll continue to grow those populations. 
uh, create, uh, continue to do the good work that you're doing to create those young forest conditions. Uh, and, and I think Golden Wings will continue to respond positively. That's all we can do anyway, is, is to do something to, to better the habitat uh, conditions and availability for the species. We need to be patient. When we look at wetland restoration and the response of wetland birds like waterfowl, um, it, it didn't happen overnight. It took people realizing in the early mid 80s that things were not working. And that's when conservation groups, NRCS, Ducks Unlimited, and many others joined partnership to create uh, and restore wetland habitat. And we see how that has responded. The great success story of the Kirtland's warbler uh, in the upper Midwest, whereby his species is, was on the endangered species list much work both conservation and conservation science and then the lessons learned from that conservation science being continually ap applied to the landscape we finally see the species reach that threshold and of course it's not out of the woods yet so to speak uh, but certainly um, warranted to be removed from the endangered species list last year so great successes there we stay the course as denise mentioned it's a marathon uh, this is this is forest management and it takes time for associated biodiversity to respond to the work we do. And it's important for us to transfer uh, the knowledge that we gain through these programs. Percent deciduous forest landscapes is important. Percent mixed forest is, is important as well, but in the opposite direction. We can go into these pl uh, conservation plans and management guidelines and, and modify the initial or original uh, recommendations and then, of course, NRCS and its partners can use this kind of information to modify how it outreaches and who it outreaches to. And of course, apply that information to application screening and ranking. It's important for us to be able to use this information. Uh, all of you have heard in the East anyway, have heard of priority areas for conservation. Those priority areas of conservation, when we take our monitoring data along with data from other sources on golden wing warbler uh, occurrence, then you can see that the golden wing, uh, the Working Lands for Wildlife project area in green is actually reduced to 13 million acres, the yellow, that are associated with these priority areas of conservation. And of course, NRCS use field offices use these areas to, um, to uh, rank uh, and uh, decide who, who, which landowners will be provided um, funds. It's also important when we have this, these packs to really kind of hone in on precision conservation, if you will, and to think about who's, who's got some really big responsibilities where uh, to conserve the species. And we can look at this diagram here uh, for the Appalachians relative to the areas covered by the packs. And you can see that Pennsylvania is this in, very large rectangle here. And in Pennsylvania, private forest owners bear a huge percentage of the yellow area we see here, with state forest and state agents uh, game lands uh, also uh, having pretty important parts. We move to states like North Carolina and Virginia and West Virginia to the south, and we see the importance of the US Forest Service, the sister agency of NRCS, right in there with private landowners. Uh, in, in their uh, need to, to have some, I guess, take on some heavy lifting to conserve the species. All of this insight possible through the monitoring that uh, the partnership has been able to do. I wanna spend a little bit of time on associated species outcomes, um, and, and we have a lot we could talk about. I'm gonna focus on two. I'm gonna focus on the American woodcock response and, and the pollinator response. And these, again, are in the context of habitats created uh, that target golden wing warbler. They target golden wing warbler, not the American woodcock, not pollinators. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind when we are talking about the results, because a golden wing warbler is a golden wing warbler, and a woodcock is a woodcock. And, and, and we're implementing strategies for the golden wing warbler. But it is important for us to understand how those efforts augment or provide potential benefits to these other species or groups. 
The American woodcock is a shorebird that's adapted for um, forest communities. And it spends, unlike the golden wing, it spends its entire annual cycle in the eastern U.S. It's more of a short distance migrant than it is a long distance migrant. Its population has been declining in both the Great Lakes regions or the central region, as they call it, or in the eastern region. And it's a very popular game bird. Uh, it's also a very popular bird in the spring for folks to go out and watch. It's really um, spectacular courtship ritual uh, in young forest areas with the display flight and the painting and, and all that comes with that. So there's a lot of interest in the American woodcock um, from, from all sorts of users. We visited uh, several 773 uniquely managed patches from 2015 to 2017. We visited the same exact points that we visited for the golden wing warbler point counts. Uh, we used a modified uh, singing grounds protocol from the developed by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and partners. Uh, modified only in that we monitored a little bit longer at each point and the point was not road based. We actually trekked into these forest stands uh, in the early evening um, and then often trekked back out in the pitch of dark um, to assess uh, singing woodcock uh, uh, abundance or occupancy. And then similar to the golden wing warbler work, we analyzed woodcock abundance at both a patch scale within a hundred meter radius and a local landscape 500 meter radius. This is a distribution of the points uh, per county that we monitored in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and New Jersey. And here is a distribution of the points that we monitored in uh, the Western Great Lakes, Wisconsin, and uh, Minnesota. And in, and in the case of the Western Great Lakes, we actually um, had a split in our woodcock um, cover types or treatment types. One would be timber harvest and then the, the other was managed shrublands. Some results. For the Appalachians, naive occupancy, uh, red is obviously really good here. We see lots of, um, lots of points occupied by at least one painting male. Overall though, 54, you know, half of our points had um, woodcock, which is, which is good. Again, it's a, it's, 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 it's a program that is targeting golden wing warbler. If we are in fact creating additional habitat for American woodcock under some landscape conditions and stand conditions, um, that's great. Contributing to the, to, to the recovery of another species is wonderful news. In the Western Great Lakes, 92% of our uh, sites were occupied by at least one American woodcock male. That is a incorrect value of 54%. Sorry about that. Um, if we look at the modeled abundance or so we can think about this as a minimum density and this would be the number of males per 3.1 hectares which um, for all of us who think better spatially in acres we're talking about this scale representing 7.5 acres so in the Appalachians uh, at sites that were occupied um, of course we're, we're looking at a you know at less than less than one male painting uh, per 7.5 acres and considerably higher response uh, to, by the bird um, in the, both the shrublands and the, the timber harvests of the Great Lakes. If we look at the predictors uh, of woodcock abundance in the Appalachians, um, you, you see the range here that we like to uh, leave basal area at within a treated site. So this is the range of the golden wing warbler. And we see that the woodcock uh, abundance falls as you leave more trees across the stand, which is not uh, necessarily surprising um, to any folks that work in the woodcock world. My point here would be that if you have landowners that are interested and they're really excited about woodcock and they wanna do good things through the golden wing warbler program, it's okay to manage a stand that's a little bit uh, leaner on the residual trees. These are the decisions that the foresters uh, make when they're having those communications with landowners. And then, of course, the other one at the landscape uh, scale was the percent mature forest in, in the upland surrounding, or, I'm sorry, in the surrounding landscape. Mature upland forest, as you had more of that in the landscape, uh, woodcock abundance 
decreased, which makes sense uh, because these are singing ground surveys and they sing in more opened areas. Um, from the context of how that jibes with golden wing warbler uh, 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 recommendations, uh, it, it, it jibes perfectly well. Uh, the, the more young forest you have in the landscape, the more habitat there is available for more golden wing warblers. Of course, for both species, we need to be thinking about we we never want to be over here. OK, this would put us into a very bad situation in the long term. We don't want to not have mature forest on the landscape. And in fact, having mature forest on the landscape and having it available in future years to create new young forest opportunities is essential. The mature forest is the pipeline of having young forest on our landscape for the long term. But in any event, uh, good news, good overlap there with golden wing warbler BMPs. In the Western Great Lakes, patch size was the most important patch level feature. Um, most of the patches were smaller in scale uh, and therefore um, obviously less room for uh, more males to do their courtship displays. Uh, again, uh, there's there's going to be, you know, this is showing the the range of sites that we visited, right? We have no doubt that if you went out to some huge uh, scale of patch size that you would have a negative response by the species. So finding that that area is, is important and understanding that again, just as we talked about in the Appalachians, you never want to have zero a mature forest in the landscape, not even for a woodcock. Um, but again, minimum acreage for golden wing warbler is 10 acres. Um, so you can go a little bit larger with some of your uh, patches in the Great Lakes when that's possible. If it's not, continue to do the work you're doing. It's, it's, it's obviously working quite well. And then, of course, we know that that jives well. I want to stop for a moment and think a little bit about golden wing warbler habitat management and the potential benefits to American woodcock. And it's, and it's at two temporal scales, if you will, two types of, two types of habitats that the species requires. The first is when the stand is initiated, so the regenerating forest, very much like what you see a golden wing warbler liking to use here. It provides singing grounds habitat. So places for males to court and identify or attract females. And then as those stands succeed and they turn into closed canopy forest, they enter what we call the stem exclusion stage and on into the pole stage. They provide really important habitat for nesting American woodcock. At the end of my finger there in this stem excluded stand in late April without leaves on yet, you see this nest uh, that a female woodcock was sitting on when I walked by. Um, important, thinking about the legacy of habitat conditions that, that are created when you do the initial young forest work uh, through, through succession. And when you do that in a way that uses sustainable forestry practices, uh, you're not only doing good things for golden wing and woodcock, but for the forest in general. Moving quickly on to some results from our native pollinator work within early successional forests. This is the work uh, of Cody Mathis's uh, master's thesis. Um, we know that pollinators are experiencing uh, a, a lot of problems themselves as a group. And we know, of course, you know, NRCS better than just about everyone else uh, knows the importance that pollinators uh, play on our landscapes, not just for native ecosystems, but for our agricultural communities as well. And that wild bees are an important part of the, of the pollination services that we, that we um, are so desperately in need of. And there was a recent study back in 2016 that, that mentioned that we needed to get a better understanding of non-agricultural settings with respect to uh, pollinator uh, abundances and biodiversity. In early successional deciduous forests uh, seem to make uh, intuitive sense that they might be really important uh, for pollinators. Why? Because most of the eastern U.S. was forested historically. Uh, we had native pollinators. They had to have been at work someplace. Um, they had to have, have, have been on our landscape, of course. 
And then when we think about young forest in particular, uh, after, soon after a harvest, there's lots of down woody material and bare ground. And those are known to be important for nesting sites for pollinators, um, for, for native bees. And then, of course, uh, a lot of, as you see in both uh, this picture and over here, there's lots of floral resources in those young forest stands that could be very important to native pollinators. So we asked the question, are young forests created through working lands for wildlife and similar public land efforts benefiting native pollinators? And we visited uh, overstory removal sites, so timber harvests that were uh, less than nine years old since treatment. Uh, and those uh, private land sites that we visited were those enrolled in working lands for wildlife. And you can see the distribution of sites that we visited each year, so 75 and uh, 100. More intensive sampling in our, in our second year, <clears throat> and we reduced our second year to sites that were less than six years old or six years old or less. We monitored pollinators uh, using two approaches, um, one doing a visual pollinator survey uh, where we uh, walked transects uh, that were 66 meters in length randomly placed throughout those stands. Uh, and off of that transect, we noted um, the distance and uh, recorded the identity to six morpho species of uh, pollinators uh, for bees. <laughs> and then of course, we tried to identify all butterflies to species. The other method for sampling pollinators in these stands was a lethal method, a collection method. Um, it, it's been shown in the literature that a variety of sampling techniques is important to best understand the, the complete, uh, as best as you can, the complete picture of, of pollinator community at a site. Uh, we conducted these collections at 40 sites. We used these blue, blue vein traps uh, elevated here, uh, pictured here and then uh, bee bowls uh, on the ground. And then, of course, uh, after 24 hours, collected those specimens, um, pinned them, and uh, identified them to species. Also along these transects, every time we ran the surveys, we also did a floral survey, uh, which is um, a, a pretty Herculean task in and of itself. Uh, and we would survey uh, these transects and identify all flowering all flowering species so they had to be blooming at the at the time of the survey <clears throat> general results um, over 7600 bees observed on the transects butterfly abundance nearly one uh, 150 i'm sorry 1500 butterflies uh, over 1.5 million total flowers counted or estimated um, and that is um, pretty <laughs> impressive number when you Think about counting and estimating that many. Um, floral diversity, pretty high, greater than 220 species identified in these stands. And then over 2,000 total uh, bees collected through these uh, 376 surveys, most of them being uh, belonging to what we call the small black bee uh, category. And then, of course, um, bumblebee um, rounding out some of the most common collected. Now it's Friday afternoon and we could show you these um, cool, or Friday morning, we could show you these um, cool graphs that um, are pretty self-explanatory, but I'm gonna throw some animation in here to, to give us an idea of what all this means. It means that bees did not really like um, tall sapling coverage. So as Stan succeeded, um, we didn't have, uh, or, or, or increase in age, we didn't have as many pollinators. They weren't as dense. They also did not like ubiquitous coverage of um, low shrub. Now, I will add a, a caveat here. This, uh, this low shrub was often blueberry and huckleberry. And uh, it's important to note that early on in the spring, those are all flowering. You can think about that being just a ton of floral resources for pollinators. But once those uh, flowers are off of those shrubs, those um, those blueberry, then actually this becomes more or less uh, kind of a desert for pollinator floral resources, which is what our data indicated. Bees, you know, they're not flowering plants, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, ferns, they're not flowering plants, uh, and the species had a negative relationship there. And then it's important to point out that grass was one of the most important features from a structural perspective. And uh, I just wanted to, you know, some of you are probably seeing it uh, in this picture. Here is a female golden wing warbler on a nest. Um, grass is known to be an important component of 
uh, nesting habitat for golden wing warblers. So we had this really nice um, relationship between uh, the, what's, what's important for pollinators and what's important for golden wing warbler nesting sites. From a floral uh, abundance and a floral diversity perspective, um, both dense uh, for, for bee density, both are very important. As floral abundance increases on a survey uh, transect, so too did bee density. As the diversity of the, flor of the flowers on that transect increased, so did bee density. And it was the same exact relationship for butterflies. Time since uh, harvest uh, is important, and, and it's actually in the reverse direction of golden wing warbler. So when we think about a site initially being implemented, and then, of course, sometime after that, early on after it, it is um, really, a lot of these sites have a, a nice collection of forbs and flowering plants that are attractive to pollinators. So you've got the down coarse woody material, bare ground, great for nesting, and then, of course, floral resources intermixed there as well. But as those sites succeed, of course, they become more dominated by woody vegetation. And they may be important early on when blueberry, um, blackberry, and other small flowering shrubs and saplings uh, are, are in bloom in the early spring. But of course, that becomes less enticing to a pollinator as the summer progresses. An, imp an important way to like, kind of like think about this is, you know, these sites that we we manage for golden wing warblers early on. Uh, they may not have golden wing warblers, but they are providing really important uh, resources for a thriving pollinator community. So spatially um, and temporally, some really interesting dynamics there. Our forests and associated biodiversity are dynamic. You know, this is going to be my concluding slide, if you will, and I'm happy to take questions. But it's important for us to be thinking about the marathon, as Denise mentioned, uh, that is before us, that we are embarking upon. And that <clears throat> forests work at a different time scale than many of us um, think about often. And, and they work at scales beyond an individual's career. Um, and that's why it's often so hard for us to kind of like think about the importance of the work we do in the long, long, long term. The work we're doing to create young forest results in courting behavior of habitat for um, the American woodcock and really important pollinator habitat for pollinators early on. As that succession continues, male golden wing warblers establish territories that attract nesting females. And as that uh, habitat continues to succeed into those closed canopy uh, forests, the stem exclusion stage, that's where golden wings bring their kids that are um, working so hard to, to become uh, little um, flying juveniles that make that uh, first effort to migrate down to South America and then hopefully return the next year to, to continue to grow our populations. And there we also have added benefits for American woodcock. If you don't have young forest at some point on the landscape as we are so desperately in need of in many of our landscapes, then you're going to be missing out on these other very important components. And in the long term, think about those species that need healthy, dynamic forest landscapes, like the cerulean warbler, like the wood thrush, like the oven bird. So many species of mature forest uh, nesting guild have been shown in recent years to take their young into these younger age class forests or structurally complex mature forests. I hope, or someone from my group, we hope to be able to come back and share future results, outcomes with, with all of you. We have a few that are wrapping up, uh, a big associated forest bird community analysis that we hope to be able to present within the next year. We're wrapping up an avian by vegetation community um, study in fenced and unfenced timber harvests. One of those publications was recently um, published in Forest Ecology and Management. It looked at the vegetation outcomes for fenced and unfenced timber harvest in Pennsylvania. And then, um, of course, we're finishing up this year our cerulean warbler monitoring in Maryland and Pennsylvania. And next year, we're excited to be starting a project that's going to be examining the use of whipper, uh, uh, the use of New England cottontail and golden wing warbler working lands for wildlife sites uh, by Whippoorwill. 
Um, that's going to extend all the way from uh, Virginia to, to northern portions of New England. Uh, Appalachian Cottontail Project here in Pennsylvania, which is co-funded with our state agency, the Pennsylvania Game Commission. And we're really excited about heading back into the Western Great Lakes and see how Working Lands for Wildlife, or I'm sorry, the RCPP, sorry, the RCPP sites are contributing to the monarch, uh, which of course is a working lands for wildlife species in, in the upper Midwest itself. I thank SEEP, uh, I thank NRCS field offices and the partner staff. We would not be able to do uh, what we have been able to do and make the progress that we're making without you. And of course, most importantly, um, the, the private landowners that we all serve and that we uh, all appreciate that care um, for, for proper stewardship of their land and the biodiversity that their lands can host. Many field technicians uh, that ventured out among the ticks and the rattlesnakes and the bears and, and, and all sorts of rough uh, topography um, poured their hearts into uh, early mornings and late nights to collect those data that we uh, were able to present today. And I'm happy to take any questions that uh, folks may have at this time. Well, thank you so thank much. You so much. Yeah. Um, um, we uh, we yeah. don't have any questions in the chat, so if anybody has a question for Jeff, we take a minute or two if people want to uh, raise your hand or just unmute your mic, and maybe I'll maybe I'll ask Denise first if she has any overall comments or questions for Jeff. Well, Jeff, this was a phenomenal presentation. I want to thank you so much um, for presenting, and I want to um, hope that we can. Uh, share this with with other field staff. Um, so, th will there be a recording of this, and will you have it posted on the IUP site, or will it be on the SEEP site, Charlie? Well, I, I did record it. It is being recorded. Um, we, we will put it on the SEEP site, and uh, I can certainly work with Jeff to to put it elsewhere uh, to make it available for folks. Sure. Well, it it was a great great presentation. It's really important for us to see outcomes associated with all the work that's being done and where we need to tweak and mm -hmm. um, either the ranking criteria or the conversations with landowners of what to expect next. So mm -hmm. it's it really good information. Thank you. Oh, you're most welcome. It's uh, it's been a pleasure to to work with NRCS and all of its partners over the last several years to do to do this work for sure. And I'm excited about where we can go for sure. And, and yes, um, we we would have um, we, we hope that everyone shares this webinar with whoever they think would be interested in um, in viewing it and in learning um, the outcomes that we've been able to to learn from. So Jeff, there is a question about: Do we know anything about uh, how salamanders react to these young forest projects? Well, we certainly we certainly have not uh, incorporated a salamander monitoring uh, program. Um, certainly, we would expect that there would be some uh, point in the implementation process where you'd have um, less uh, vegetative cover overhead, drier sites. Um, but of course, for a succession in the long uh, long haul, you know, we we get to that stem exclusion category pretty well. I think it would be really interesting to look at these sites when you think about all of that down woody material and the importance that that has for um, forest dwelling salamanders. Uh, thinking about a study that examines salamander abundance diversity in sites after that canopy is closed. But certainly, again, there's probably um, instances where, you know, like all, all management, there's going to be some temporal, um, there's some, some time frame in which uh, a certain taxa may not optimally respond to it. But it's a good question. There's lots of things that we would benefit from monitoring. More questions and there are answers for sure, but uh, it's good to see the progress that we have been making. And uh, certainly I'm grateful to be part of the partnership with uh, IUP, Cornell and others that have uh, made all this work possible. So I don't see any other questions in the chat. Uh, is there anything else from anybody on the audience before we shut down here? Yeah, this is uh, Taryn in Maryland, and I would just echo Denise's uh, comments that uh, we really appreciate. Uh, I really appreciate seeing this presentation, and it's good to see that the overall effort is moving along uh, so well. 
And, uh, you know, again, I know Mark Maryland is a relatively small uh, portion of the overall effort, but certainly uh, this is important work uh, for our partners and for our landowners out in the Western uh, Maryland landscape. So Jeff, again, just appreciate all the work you guys are doing up there. And uh, certainly we want to continue to make a contribution to the effort. Thank you, Taryn. Appreciate that. Okay, last chance for any other uh, any other comments or questions. Well, there is a question that popped up on the chat. Uh, is there anything or uh, any research conducted specific to response from management of alder? There is. Um, a matter of fact, um, the shrubland golden wing warbler component that we uh, that I mentioned earlier uh, in the Great Lakes. That is actually, uh, we actually teamed up with Amber Roth from the University of Maine, who has a, a history of working in the Western Great Lakes landscape. Her student um, uh, actually focused on the aspen and alder shearing uh, for her uh, master's work. Um, we're actually working on a manuscript and some final analyses of that uh, at the moment. Uh, the the, the take-home message there, of course, would be that structure is important. Uh, making sure that um, it, in, in those landscapes, unlike starting early with a mature forest, right, uh, and in, in having to to wait for succession to occur, you have an opportunity to manipulate those habitats in a way that leaves you with the structure that golden wing warblers need uh, early on. So, yes, that is a uh, potential presentation here in the very near future. And that would uh, focus on both aspen and uh, aspen shearing and alder shearing were the two um, communities that we examined. All right, great. Well, thank you, Jeff. Um, we've run a little over our hour time slot we had uh, set for this, but I greatly appreciate everyone's uh, uh, participation, hanging in there with us. And uh, again, thanks to Jeff uh, for you and your team's work on this effort. So. I'll go ahead and conclude the uh, presentation and uh, wish everyone a, a great rest of the day. And uh, thanks. Thank you, Charlie. Appreciate everyone's attendance. Thank okay. you, Charlie. Thanks, Jeff.